I read a book by Keith Johnstone called Impro. It's about improvisational theater, and it was recommended to me by my friend Boyd Branch. We taught a graduate course to engineers and scientists on improvisational theater as a way of helping the scientists um, communicate their science. We were inspired by Alan Alda's work on um, making a connection with your audience. One of the rules of impro is make your partner look good. And so you gotta, when you're doing impro, you gotta put your own status, your own ego, make it subservient to what you're trying to do for the audience. Put the audience's needs ahead of yours. The insightful thing in John Stone's book that Boyd emphasized for me was that entertaining impro has a conscious awareness of what are called status transactions. John Stone says in here, you tell me what the status of the different characters are and I can do any scene. It wasn't method acting or some other mode. It was all about being aware, being conscious of what the status transactions. How do the characters communicate different statuses to one another? And that's how he can act. Well, Boyd helped us break it down like this. There are high and low social statuses. And these are so important to human beings because we're such highly social creatures. We've evolved in tribal existences in which status is a matter of survival. We must understand where in the hierarchy are we, high or low. He says there are also kind of a, an affective, an emotional, or an attitudinal orientation. And um, it can be pleasant or unpleasant. Once you understand status transactions according to this quadrant, then you can identify outside the theater, outside the, the context of entertainment or science communication, you can often identify what's going on in groups and communication. Each one of these um, strategies in the quadrant, according to Boyd, is defensive. I'll give you an example. Um, high status, don't bite me. I bite back. That would be an example of unpleasant high. Grrr, threatening. But you might say, don't bite me. I don't taste very good. And that would be an example of unpleasant low. There are comedians that play with these status transactions. Rodney Dangerfield was famous for, I don't get no respect. He's playing pleasant low status. He's funny in his sort of self-deprecating way. And when you're a stand-up comedian on the stage and you get invited to be on the Johnny Carson show and you're making millions of dollars, this sort of un this pleasant, low, self-deprecating humor can work out really well for you. But of course, there's also pleasant, high status. The king with a good sense of humor. The pleasant, high status lifts other people up. It establishes the high status within the tribe or the organization. And it says, I'm secure in my position relative to others. As I lift others up, my status goes up too. Whereas unpleasant high pushes others down. It establishes a high status position relative to other people by lowering their status. So pleasant high is like, one of the best of all possible ways to lead. You're lifting others up as your status goes up with them. Pleasant low will bring you down and unpleasant low can bring you down even further. When you go with the self-deprecating, and sometimes you're in the presence of people who are very high status, and you might as well be pleasant about it, it's really easy to sneak under their status. So. Boyd, in any case, would have us try all of these different quadrants in our improvisational transactions, in our scenes. And what I discovered is that I was really good with the high status, and I needed a lot of practice on the low status, at least when I was doing 
improv. Well, isn't that interesting? Every once in a while, outside the context of the theater, we will encounter these people who make unpleasant high offerings that push us down. When we encounter these people, it may be unpleasant, but it's not very threatening. And when we encounter these people, we could have a laugh. This is the Joker, the character who makes everyone smile and often at their own expense. These people, because they're non-threatening, we needn't concern ourselves with these people who would push us down are both unpleasant to deal with and threatening. So what do we do? What is the transaction that we would play when we are faced with the unpleasant customer, the unpleasant landlord, the unpleasant person who presumes a high status? And this is where this video takes a little bit of a turn because I've got to credit Athol K. He wrote a book called The Married Man Sex Life Primer. He updated it in, to, well, several years later, and he started a forum for the readers of his book that I enjoyed, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. One of the things that Athol did in this forum was, without referring to improvisational theater, talk about these different kinds of status transactions. He used to work as a nurse in, um, could be what they would might call a mental health ward. He'd say that he'd encounter a lot of unpleasant patients. And although people would say, well, that person's crazy, one of Athol's principles was it's amazing how sane and reasonable crazy people get when you show them the taser. In his mental health ward. It was sometimes they were required, the nurses would be required to immobilize a patient who's become violent, who's become dangerous. And Apple said it was amazing how reasonable their behavior came when you showed them the taser. And this is an approach that I find when people are coming at you from this unpleasant high position, sometimes you can't afford to be pleasant, whether it's high status or low status, because they're going to continue to come at you with what Athol would say is an unreasonable request in an unreasonable tone. How should you deal with these people? If I show them the taser, I mean this is an uncompromising look at the consequences that may be waiting for them. It could be that with unpleasant high, you must come back with unpleasant high. Allow them to realize the weakness in their own position by showing them what you're willing to do. I'm not saying that you want to do it, but what you're willing to do when you're faced with their recalcitrance. On the basis of this advice, that I didn't get actually in this book, that I got from the author of this book on a forum that is now defunct in which he engaged readers. And wouldn't it be lovely if I had such a forum for Keith Johnstone? On the basis of what I learned from Athol K, I have, upon occasion, encountered people here for whom I must show them that I'm able to build these negative consequences that will befall them if they cannot switch their requests and their tone to something more reasonable.